Good evening. Welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm Stephen Mangan. In the news this week, in China, responding to international pressure, Apple grudgingly allow their iPad factory workers out for a five-minute tea break. <laughs> On the Costa del Sol, as an East End gang burst into a bank with sawn-off shotguns, the safecracker realises that he's overslept. <laughs> and in Westminster, Eric Pickles finally gets round to cleaning the fluff out of his belly button. <laughs> it's delicious on toast. <laughs> With Ian tonight is a writer and broadcaster who says she hates people who are chronically pedantic over punctuation. Hang on. On Ian's team, comma, <laughs> please welcome Grace Dent. <laughs> and with Paul tonight is the son of a vicar who studied divinity at university, plays a Church of England lay reader in the sitcom Rev, and is odds on to become the new Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> Miles Jupp. And we start with the bigger stories of the week. Ian and Grace, take a look at this. Oh. Wow. Tax return? Never a welcome sight. No tax due. Yeah. Ah, that's one of Downing Street's kitchen suppers. <laughs> <laughs> Quite exciting. Oh, look, here's George Osborne. He's not had a good time recently. He hasn't. He's just spotted some tax someone's paid. <laughs> <laughs> very, very small. <laughs> Essentially, Osborne was incredibly amazed to find that a lot of rich people and rich companies don't pay any tax. Yes, that's I mean, true. it was a yeah. discovery right up there with gravity and, <laughs> and DNA. Uh, can you name another tax dodge the government are trying to stamp out? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Osborne was, was trying, but, I mean, this is the problem at the moment. It's all incompetence. He was trying to stop rich people um, avoiding tax, but what he ended up doing was, was stopping them giving away money to charity. Yes, currently you can claim tax relief on every penny you give to charity, but according to David Cameron, in certain instances people may be giving to charities which don't do a great deal of charitable work. Like Eton, for example. <laughs> <laughs> um... This is the worst thing he could have possibly done, because it just makes him look even more like the child catcher from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is the shock news that many people try to avoid paying tax. Uh, my favourite is one senior Tory party donor spent a night in a private jet flying from Luton Airport out of British airspace yeah. to avoid staying in the country for more than 90 days, so thus qualifying as a resident abroad <laughs> for tax purposes. In a plane? Yeah. In a plane. Brilliant. Could he not just get in a hot air balloon and tether that about three feet off the ground? Then he's not on the planet. You, so you've therefore... got to leave the airspace. Oh, you've got to leave the airspace. Yeah. Oh, so if you went so in an you air balloon... just jump up and down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure about that? Yeah. What do you think Philip Green's doing? Yeah. yeah, I know what he's doing, but I don't think it's that... Well, anyway. <laughs> London Luton is so far away from London that it's actually in international airspace. <laughs> he flew from Luton out of British airspace. I think if you touch down anywhere, they might get you for tax. Oh, I see. So it's more enjoyable as a rich person to go nowhere. <laughs> sit in an aeroplane thinking, I'm saving money. Yeah. They're a miserable bunch. Yes, this story <laughs> appeared on the Mail Online website. Uh, oh, but yes. did you read what Eric Swindon, sorry, that's Eric, comma, Swindon, Grace, <laughs> uh, had to say about this? <laughs> he said, what's morally repugnant, George, is the excessive level of tax. If a thief took 50% of everything you earn, you would be indignant. But the government think it's their right to take it and then throw it away on benefit scroungers. That is morally repugnant, <laughs> George. Seems like a nice chap. <laughs> uh, so when it comes to tax, what does every politician really want? To be able to declare their own tax affairs, make them public. Transparency. Exactly. It? Yes. Exactly. And what do they mean by transparency in this case? Uh, we're not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> they mean revealing a very small amount of information that doesn't tell you too much. Yeah. So you just put your income in. And if income isn't your big thing, if, say, assets, say you're in the Cabinet, um, <laughs> Just thinking randomly, um, <laughs> then you don't have to declare those. So, you know, transparency up to a point mm. which is opaque. Mm. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, yes. Yes, according to The Guardian, there is an agreement between Cameron and Osborne that all senior ministers should be transparent. <laughs> <Let's hope. laughs> 
Let's hope they don't mean Eric Pickles. <laughs> Yuck. Uh, according to The Express, Cameron is relaxed about revealing his income tax returns. Uh, according to The Telegraph, George Osborne says he hasn't set his face against it. Which face does he use when he sets his face <laughs> against it? Does he use this face? Oh. Or this face? <laughs> or this face? <laughs> Uh, so why is it all kicking off now? What started this rumpus? It's Ken Livingston. That's right. It was discovered that Ken had said that people who avoid tax are rich bastards who shouldn't be allowed to vote. Mm -hmm. And then it turned out that he pays a lot of his earnings into a, into a company and pays not tax at 40% but corporate tax at 21%. And a lot of people irresponsibly thought he's avoiding tax. <laughs> what a bastard. <laughs> Then there was a fight between him and Boris. In a radio station, in a lift. What did he call him? Did he call him a lying wanker? No, almost. almost. It was the F word. <laughs> lying wanker. <laughs> I'm not helping here, am I? <laughs> that happens to be one of our finest banks. <laughs> You're very close. Boris screamed mm. into Ken's face, You're a f liar. <laughs> Presumably a phrase Boris picked up from his wife. <laughs> <laughs> How's Ken's election campaign going? Well, he was shown a film for himself this week and he was absolutely moved to tears by the image of himself. <laughs> just, yeah. just people talking about how wonderful he was. I he think had we a little have a cry, picture. but not just a little cry, a proper cry. Oh. <laughs> it's like a cartoon bear cry. He's saying, I don't believe you're leader of the Labour Party. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be interesting to know what Miliband is smelling at that particular moment. <laughs> I met Ken just before Christmas. I was doing a, a panel uh, with him, and as part of that panel, I was given someone uh, gave me a gift of a copy of the Quran. And uh, afterwards, I went into the green room, and Ken was sitting on the arm of a sofa, and I was carrying the Quran uh, and a biro. And uh, he looked up at me, and I, and I said as a joke, "Would you sign this for me, Ken?" <laughs> And he went, yeah, all right. And he took it from me and signed it, so I now have well, quite an inflammatory piece of literature in some people's <laughs> eyes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and which trendy, ultra-touchy-feely companies have been avoiding tax? Amazon, who've made £7 billion pounds and paid no corporate sales tax. Are yeah, that's perfectly know, reasonable. That's a tax rate of 0%. <laughs> they made billions of pounds and they pay no tax. Yeah, uh, what's your problem? There's a difference between avoidance and evasion, though. It's like, yes. you would evade. I would not. <laughs> <laughs> I might evade. I'm not Ken Livingston, you know. <laughs> but then there's also things like that, um, that thing that people like Mick Jagger and Ringo Starr and uh, Bob Geldof have done, where you get your property and then you put it into a company abroad and then if you... But got something that's worth 50 billion, you don't pay any tax on it. Are you suggesting what they're doing is wrong? I think Bob that's... Bob Geldorf? <laughs> I think that's wrong. Is that not wrong? You so... pronounce him like he's a character in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Geldorf! Um, I don't think any of these people are suspected of any wrongdoing. Yes, Amazon is under investigation by UK tax authorities for registering its UK sales operation in Luxembourg, claiming only its distribution arm is in the UK. In 2010, they would have paid £35 million in UK tax, but they managed to reduce that slightly to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Google are using a Dutch sandwich. Have you tried a Dutch sandwich, Ian? Um... <laughs> Google's UK operation is based in Ireland, uh, yes. where the rate of tax is half that of Britain. Uh, they then funnel the profits via the Netherlands to Bermuda, which enables them to pay a tax rate of a quarter of 1%. Blimey. If you Google tax, does it give you nothing? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, moving from a tax on the rich and privileged to a tax on the rich and privileged. See what I did there. Mm. Can you think of any attacks on the rich and privileged recently? Anyone yeah. swimming? Yes. Trenton. Attack. Trenton. Trenton. Trenton Oldfield swam into the middle of the Thames and stopped the boat race. He was doing things like encouraging anarchist cleaners to not put toilet roll in the toilets of rich people. <laughs> I just wiped their bums with 
poor people. Then. Yeah. Right. <laughs> really achieving any aims, is it? Uh, someone posted this on YouTube of Trenton in action. According to the mail, they shouted, Boo! <laughs> and take him to the tower. <laughs> and most devastatingly of all, is it David Walliams? <laughs> uh, let's not forget, while we're arguing the toss over income tax, the Greek economy could drag us all down. Here's Jeremy Paxman using his scalpel like analysis on the former Greek finance minister. Joining us now from Athens is Yorgos Papakonstantino, in the middle of last year. He was Greece's finance minister, now he's minister for the environment. Also with us is the former Conservative cabinet minister, John Redwood. Uh, Mr. Papakonstantino, I forgi uh, forgive me, I'm so sorry. This is the row over tax avoidance by the rich, or as they're known since the budget, the richer. <laughs> According to a recent poll, 60% of people don't trust George Osborne with the nation's finances. The other 40% don't follow current affairs. <laughs> Adding to the heartbreak of the rich, this week was Trenton Oldfield, who disrupted the boat race. Although, to be fair, it's not the first sighting of a turd in the Thames. <laughs> Yes, this was the 158th boat race shown live on the BBC. According to The Sun, millions of TV viewers watched in stunned silence or posted angry messages on Twitter. And then a bloke appeared in the water to liven things up. <laughs> Paul and Miles, some recent history for you. Mm. OK, right, well, this is the uh, Pasty Gate story. There's David Cameron there, and uh, it's the uh, Sunday Times filming this bloke, uh, Kradas, saying, oh, there's the jerry cans, fill them up with petrol. If you haven't got a jerry can, keep it in your mouth. Francis Maud, <laughs> yes, giving that ridiculous <laughs> advice that people should store petrol in their sheds or their garages or their second houses. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just an absolute nightmare situation where people are doing it. It's very dangerous. So this is the thing about uh, if you can't store it in your garage, store it in a pasty, because at least you know where it is. <laughs> And as long as you don't heat it up, you won't pay 20% tax. <laughs> or indeed blow your house up. So, it's pasties and petrol, but I'm never quite sure which is which. Yes, this is a look back at recent government gaffes involving the price of pasties, the panic buying of petrol, and the total pillock, Peter Cruddus. <laughs> uh, how did George Osborne turn a pasty into a hot potato? Well, it's some sort of rule now, isn't it? So if you buy your pasty cold, it costs so much money, but if it's then heated up, it then pay 20% extra because it's now become an ambient pasty. Mm. It's become uh, more than room temperature. Paul's not only right, but I think if you queue for the pasty um, while it's being warmed up and then it goes cold again, it does this, the graph of what you have to pay. So at the beginning of the queue, it's 20% up, but if it goes cold again, it's a cold pasty. So it's 20% down. Yeah, so if you buy a pasty that's hot, you take it home and it's cold, you're, you're owed a rebate. <laughs> yes, it's a terrifically well-thought-out piece of legislation. <laughs> uh, after accusations the government was out of touch with ordinary people's love of pasties, what was David Cameron quick to announce? Well, he, he said I had a, a pasty recently. And he said he'd eaten this in Leeds, and it's been proved that Leeds disappeared about five years ago, <laughs> so it's no longer there. So. <laughs> Leeds no longer exists. They yes. got relegated from the Premiership and uh, the, the actual area was taken down. <laughs> <laughs> Dismantled. Yes, that's right. It's a real acting like... talent, isn't it? Yeah. For all those people, because Ed Miliband immediately went with Ed Balls mm. to Greg's. Yeah. And they both ate a pie and the Tory cabinet had to all go to Greg's. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the size of these volivants? <laughs> They're huge. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Somebody in there? Hello. <laughs> It's good. It's good advertising for Greg's, though, isn't yeah. it? Because if they get VAT added to their products, that's about their only chance of having any kind of luxury label. Can you eat pasties, Ian? No, well, you see, I commute, and I was very keen that the tax on pasties should go up to a million pounds. Because <laughs> the train I get is full of blokes who've had too much to drink getting a pasty, hoping it's going to soak it all up, and they shove it in their face, <laughs> and I'm sitting there trying to do the crossword. <laughs> Twenty minutes into the journey, nothing. <laughs> <laughs>
Sometimes I just fill in anything to make people opposite <laughs> me think I can do it. <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> Pasty, Don't. pasty. That's <laughs> quite a sad life you can up there, yeah? <laughs> These pasty, chomping, beer-soaked individuals who you're trying to impress by doing the crossword. <laughs> There's issues of self-esteem <laughs> here, I think. <laughs> Very sad. Is it in First Class, Ian, that people sit opposite you eating pasties? No, I uh, no it's not First Class. No, it's ordinary. You travel in standards? Yeah. Don't you feel threatened? <laughs> He's got his own train. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, David Cameron said he loved a hot pasty and had indeed recently bought one from the West Cornwall Pasty Company. He went on to tell this highly amusing anecdote. I seem to remember I was in Leeds Station at the time um, and the choice was whether to have one of their small ones or their large ones and I got a feeling I opted for the large one and very good it was too. <laughs> I think he was talking about their pasties there, not, <laughs> not Lee Station's wide variety of prostitutes. <laughs> uh, so, was that an end? Sorry, what did you say, you guys? <laughs> I didn't say anything. Oh, okay, fine. No. You're miming to a backing tape. I was out of British airspace at that oh, time. Fair uh, was that an end to the matter? Uh, probably not. Everyone jumped on the bandwagon, didn't they? A spokesman announced that Nick Clegg had eaten a pasty in the last few months <laughs> at the Paddington station. <laughs> How big was it if it's taken him a few months to eat it? <laughs> he was waiting for Ian to turn up with the crossword. <laughs> and Ed Davey, the Liberal Democrat Energy Secretary, pointed out he loves Cornish pasties <laughs> and once worked in a pork pie factory. <laughs> and now he works in an even bigger one. <laughs> Uh, yes, and just as everything was beginning to die down, Housing Minister Grant Shapps did his party no favours uh, in this interview on The Andrew Marr Show, where, despite being asked completely unrelated questions, uh, he seemed a man obsessed with shoehorning pasties into the interview. And isn't there a risk now that people are thinking either this is an incompetent government or this is a government that is not all in it together and that is supporting the rich? Look, we can spend an interview like this talking about pasties and whether they're hot or cold and, and so on and so forth. It, what's worse, to be accused of incompetence or to be accused of being a party of the rich? These are the really big issues. That, the deficit reduction, the things which are going to change this country radically, like Michael Gove's education reforms, those are the things that matter. Of course, we can talk about pasties and who knows who and <laughs> for how long. Opinion polls suggest that you're a party of chums. This is a government that actually understands that what you need to do is govern for everyone. And again, a bit like the pasties. <laughs> What's he up to? We also saw Peter Cruddus, who was the Tory party co-treasurer. What was he offering to feed to David Cameron? Money. Money. Donors. You got to have dinner with, with Cameron if you paid up enough money. And you could influence government policy for literally just £250,000. So <laughs> Labour should have put up somebody, paid £250,000, go in there, influence government policy. <laughs> Easy, don't have to win an election. Absolutely. <laughs> Only 250,000 was just for a kitchen supper. But no, I mean, what's a kitchen supper at your house? Well, a kitchen supper is for people you don't want to let in the dining room. There you go, I see. <laughs> yes, no, Cruddus was secretly filmed offering access to David Cameron in exchange for large donations to the Tory party and offered to feed their views into the policy unit at number 10. Let's have a look at a meeting with undercover reporters from the Sunday Times. 200 grand, 250 is Premier League. Right. If you're unhappy about something, you can get, we can, we'll, we'll listen to you and we'll put it into the policy committee at number 10. We feed all feedback into the policy committee. What you can't see is that he's talking to Nick Clegg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, according to the Sunday Times, Peter Cruddis boasted that he'd flattered one donor, Lord Glendenbrook, into making a million pound donation. How did he do that? Oh, he said, oh, we're going to put you on the banknotes. <laughs> <laughs> It was a pyjama party. Yes. At uh, number 10. <laughs> 250 gets you sort of dinner, mm. but if you pay more, then you can stay on for the <clears throat> entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, there's like, they get a bit drunk and there's a sort of bottle or whatever, and they yeah. say, oh, oh, let's play Twister, and they go, oh, I've forgotten my trousers. <laughs> um, it's one of the. <laughs> It was one of those nights. Yeah. Yeah. We go, oh, it's a bit late. Why don't you stay? Well, I haven't got any pyjamas. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put the central heating on. <laughs> when you said pyjama You wake parts. up in the morning just feeling so sort of... <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I said pajama party. I had images of David Cameron and Lord Glendenbrook brushing their teeth together. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's quite sweet. Yeah. It's not. It's bribery. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Has that been cleared with the lawyer that last No, week? it will be. He'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Cameron is crooked. <laughs> <laughs> no, he flattered him into doing it by presenting him with a birthday card personally signed by David Cameron. Oh. When the undercover reporters asked what tactics he'd used to persuade the Prime Minister to make the gesture, he replied, I told number 10, get him to sign the frigging card. <laughs> Uh, the spotlight soon fell on other donors, according to the Daily Mail. Baron Laidlaw of Rothermay has made donations totalling £3 million, but heaped embarrassment on the Tories when he admitted being an orgy-loving sex addict. Mr Cameron was forced to withdraw the whip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how did Francis Moore deftly manage to distract attention from the damage being done by pasties and Peter Crudders? Uh, put petrol in your bath. <laughs> Drink as much of it as you can. Keep it in your hat. <laughs> Instead of a spare pram in the hallway that the children are growing out of. Now, liberally cover it in petrol. And push it outside on a hot, sunny day with magnified glass above it. <laughs> Make your children wear paper clothes. <laughs> All that sort of stuff. Yes. <laughs> He suggested that a bit of extra fuel in a jerry can in the garage is a sensible precaution to take. So instead of rushing to the garage to panic buy petrol, thousands of motorists first rushed to Halfords to panic buy jerry cans. <laughs> Sales of which shot up by 500%. Uh, one motorist near Cambridge summed up the situation. It's such a waste of time, particularly as there isn't even a strike yet. And having given his verdict on the utter stupidity of people panic buying petrol, he added, I've been sitting in the queue <laughs> for an hour. <laughs> Uh, in other political news, George Galloway won an ultra-safe Labour seat in what he called the Bradford Spring. How did he appeal to the voters? He spoke about things in which they're interested and about which they feel passionately, and they agreed with him. <laughs> <laughs> he went for the Islamic vote, and there were a lot of them, and they voted for him. Yeah. And democratically, that means he wins. Uh, anyone hear what he had to say about politics and bottoms? I put it down to a tidal wave of alienation in the country, and not just in Bradford, against the Tweedledee, Tweedledum politics of the major parties. If a backside could have three cheeks, they would be the three cheeks of that backside. The Tweedledee, Tweedledum, Tweedledee and a half, if a, if a backside could have three cheeks, they're sitting uh, in the House of Commons. The three main political parties all offer one variety or other of the same thing. If a backside could have three cheeks, they would be the three cheeks of the same backside. A tidal wave of dissatisfaction, alienation, derision even, against the mainstream political parties, who all really stand for the same things. If a backside could have three cheeks, they would be those three cheeks. Yeah. Of course, a backside with three cheeks would require one massive arsehole. <laughs> That he persevered at all, as if every night he was sitting down with his PR people and they were going, I tell you what's working really well, the anti-war stuff, obviously people quite like that, but the thing you say about the bottoms... <laughs> <laughs> this is the run of scandals, including Pastigate, Dinnergate and the totally unnecessary panic over petrol caused by ill-advised comments from Tory Minister Francis Maud's gate. <laughs> the Prime Minister was caught telling lies about the last time he ate a pasty. David Cameron now claims he always has an end-of-the-day pasty on the train. David, that's a beef Wellington. <laughs> David Cameron claimed to have had a pasty in a Yorkshire pasty shop that actually had closed five years earlier, just after Eric Pickles moved from Yorkshire to London. <laughs> As panic buying continued, one AA man reported seeing a 75-year-old woman at a petrol station filling up 20 empty paint tins and a tray of jam jars. <laughs> Which sounds mad, but to be fair, it's the only way to store it, as she didn't have a car. <laughs> <laughs> Time now for the odd one out round. Ian and Grace, your four are the First Lady of Syria, Asma al-Assad, Anthony Worrell-Thompson, a passenger aboard a private jet at Luton Airport, and online shopper Mr Chio. Is this about shopping? She does a lot of online shopping, so you can see the things that she's been treating herself to while thousands have been killed. Yeah, so well, it would get of... you down, wouldn't it? <laughs> exactly. You'd need to go so and buy a chandelier. Of... Yeah. Anthony Worrell-Thompson shops old 
five finger discount, doesn't he? <laughs> what does that mean? Nicking stuff. No, <laughs> <laughs> Different world, isn't it? <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Who's the guy with the, who's, is, does, is he buying things? He's an online shopper, uh, that's the clue. So he's he's shopping online, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> it's like watching Sherlock Holmes at his finest, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Teasing out the truth from just a slender strand of clue. <laughs> They're all candidates to become the next director general. What, including Luton Airport? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it tax? It's to do with paying. Right, well, he doesn't pay. Yeah. Are we, ah, she hasn't paid any of her bills? No, not quite. Because we don't know. <laughs> we could add to the general air of uh, gloom and despondency by also saying we don't know either. Good. <laughs> They've yeah. all avoided paying the full amount, apart from an online shopper named Mr Chio, who paid a total of 12 million Taiwanese dollars to buy a croissant over the internet. Anybody got any idea how he would do that? He pressed the button that said, do you want to pay millions and millions <laughs> of amount of money for this croissant? Yes or no? And he pressed the yes button. But mind you, it's probably only 25p, isn't it? It translates as 250,000 pounds. Oh, well, dealing with David Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't a Nigerian writing to him saying, would you like one of our five croissants? You have inherited a croissant. <laughs> <laughs> Just pay us £250,000 and you can have this Nigerian croissant. Wow! God, I'd like that. Your uh, uncle, Greg the Baker, <laughs> has died. <laughs> Uh, no, he kept paying over and over again after a number of phone calls asking for repayment uh, from these uh, scoundrels uh, before his bank details were used to fleece him out of even more cash. Uh, and he ended up paying £250,000. No, he couldn't have ended up paying. He couldn't have paid £250,000. He, he couldn't did, have done. He did, he did. But where would he get £250,000 from? Well, uh, he's obviously a very rich man. Uh, he's, uh... How can anybody that stupid, <laughs> <laughs> unless he's inherited, oh, I've got £250,000, go on, half hungry. Let's have a look. <laughs> that may, I'll have one of them. The fact is, he never received his croissant. Oh, he just thought he just gets worse and worse. <laughs> Asma al-Assad. Uh, what exactly was she trying to avoid paying the full price for? A croissant, 250 <laughs> grand. <laughs> I know I can get it for half that amount. It was actually a Ming vase, uh. costing £3,047.50. According to The Guardian, she sent details of the vase to the family's London-based fixer, Suleiman Marouf. Masouf did a great job responding, bought it, got 15% discount, delivery 10 weeks. She faces a two-year prison sentence because her shopping spree may have broken financial sanctions imposed on her husband. Still 15%, right. eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anthony Royal Thompson, of course, was caught shoplifting from Tesco's. Yeah. According to the Daily Mail, it was three onions and two tubs of discounted coleslaw. Oh. The toughest ever set of ingredients on Ready Steady Cook. <laughs> uh, he did also take wine and cheese. How did the Sun's headline writers respond to this story? Ready Steady Crook. <laughs> I could have been a journalist. You could have been. There's <laughs> still time. <laughs> and more wine and cheese based punnery. Look what well, this bastard stolen. <laughs> well, they went for I've been a damn fool, but I'll be Gouda <sighs> from now on. Uh, and we have already talked about the passenger aboard a private jet at Luton Airport, who is an unnamed Tony Donor. Tony Donor? <laughs> <laughs> Tony Donor, I know him, Tony. Good luck on Tony. Uh, yes, the passenger who, uh, uh, an unnamed to Tory toner, <laughs> who frequently called a helicopter to Luton Airport before zooming out of UK airspace in his private jet to avoid paying his full share of tax. Asma al-Assad's parents were originally from Homs, and the house where they lived is now commemorated with a large crater. <laughs> Asma al-Assad used to be an investment banker, one of the very few bankers to move on to something even more evil. <laughs> Paul and Miles, here's yours. <laughs> Harry Redknapp, Elizabeth Murdoch, mm -hmm. Rebecca Brooks, and Ned Kelly. Ah, uh, these all candidates to be Archbishop of Canterbury, aren't they? <laughs> Ned Kelly, what do we know about Ned Kelly? Um, his body was discovered was it? last year uh -huh. in a mass grave. Not his head. I didn't know it was him then. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how they knew it was him. Yeah. I, think, I think they were experts. Oh, right, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, that, that isn't something that's been... None of the others have been found in... Unmarked graves. Unmarked graves. No. It can't be that, can it? That would have been extraordinary. Yeah. <laughs> it's something to do with a particular type of animal. 
dog. Oh, it's a horse. It's a horse. Rebecca Brooks had a horse, didn't she? That was lent to her by the Metropolitan Police. Is it, is it a horse? You're looking... It is a horse. Right. Mm. Mm. Okay. Uh, oh, no. Harry Redknott. Rod Harry Redknott. <laughs> They're a popular bid combo, my love. Well, was... <laughs> well, he was involved in a, a case about avoiding tax. Yes. Mm. And he'd set up a, an offshore account in the name of his dog. Mm. Is that right? That is right. And the jury found him innocent. They did. Rightly. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've all been arrested, apart from Elizabeth Murdoch. Yes, if you throw in the horse bit of that, between you, you have the right answer. They've all been arrested for horse-related horse crimes, apart from one of them. Yeah. Who hasn't? Oh, yeah. did he steal? <laughs> He's, he was a horse thief. She lent a horse. And he opened an account in the name of a dog. <laughs> so the odd one out is? Is Elizabeth. The Elizabeth Murdoch. Is the correct answer. Mm. Uh, she is the odd one out. They've all been accused of receiving a horse improperly. Uh, oh, of course! <laughs> <laughs> What's the proper way to receive a horse? Apart from Elizabeth Murdoch, who had her horse improperly taken away. Anyone know by whom? Um, by her father. Yes. Oh. Elizabeth Murdoch revealed in an interview with Tatler magazine that as a young girl she had a favourite pony and one day she went to nuzzle it only to find the animal had vanished. She then asked her father where it was and he said, I've given it away in a News of the World Readers competition. Oh. <laughs> That's how how she many News of the World Readers have got accommodation for a pony? <laughs> but he's been more generous to her since. Yes, he bought her television company. For? A lot. £129 million. <laughs> uh, uh, fortunately, the flurry of revelations about the scandalous behaviour at News International has died down now, hasn't it, Ian? No. Oh. There have been some um, people say they've been hacked in America, which means it, the whole thing will start up again, and the Americans are very, very cross about that sort of thing. Well, there's a whole file leaked on the internet, wasn't there, this week, yeah. that, that absolutely nobody will talk about. What's it about? I can't talk about it. Can you not? No, I, well, I could. Could I you could. sort of ex explain <laughs> some elements of the story in some sort of charade form? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, well, it's just the same old, same old, same old, same old. It's people doing things that they're not meant to do and hassling celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come out. Okay. It'll come out <laughs> at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Harry Redknapp received a horse from football agent Willie McKay, a gift that was investigated as part of the Stevens inquiry into corruption in football. How did Harry try and argue that the horse wasn't a bung? He said he, he didn't have a head for figures, it was a gift from a friend. The friend had put it in an offshore account in, in, in the name of his dog. Mm. What could be more innocent than that? Did he say it was a present for his child, wasn't there? No, he said it wasn't a bung because it was a useless horse. <laughs> <laughs> He told the inquiry it was possible uh, he owned the horse. He did admit to that. Uh, can anyone, how, uh, we've already talked about, well, I, 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 oh. uh, Rebecca Brooks, when editor of The Sun in 2008, was apparently lent a horse by the Metropolitan Police. It was actually at a restaurant. Yeah. Uh, she was offered a horse at a restaurant, I'm presuming a French restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> the horse, who hmm. was called Razor, who rode her? The, the Prime Minister rode yes, the horse. Yes, David Cameron rode her. Here he is in, admitting that he did, in fact, oh, ride right. the horse. Yes, I did um, go riding with him. Uh, he has a number of different horses. And, yes, one of them was this former police horse, Razor, which I did uh, ride. I'm very sorry to hear that uh, Razor is no longer with us. Um, and I think I should probably conclude by saying I don't think I'll be getting back into the saddle any time soon. <laughs> Another good anecdote there from Dave. <laughs> Uh, Ned Kelly um, yes. was an Australian outlaw, yeah. wasn't he? In he 1871, was. he was yeah. sentenced to three years hard labour for improperly receiving a stolen horse. Uh, anyone know the name of Ned Kelly's first victim? Mm. The clue is he was a Chinese trader. His name was R. Fook. <laughs> Coincidentally... Oh, oh, well, also, he's dying words. <laughs> 
they have all been accused of receiving a horse improperly, apart from Elizabeth Murdoch, who had her horse improperly taken away. After initially denying it, David Cameron admitted riding horses belonging to Rebecca and Charlie Brooks, saying, One of them was the former police horse, which I did ride. Just to be clear, Nick Clegg never rode the horse. <laughs> he was too busy mucking out the stables. <laughs> Harry Redknapp was unknowingly given a horse by his agent. <laughs> he was also unknowingly given a pony and several monkeys. <laughs> Harry Redknapp's horse looks good, runs well for most of the race, then it inexplicably <laughs> fades and finishes behind Arsenal. <laughs> Mick Jagger played the title role in the movie of Ned Kelly's short but turbulent life. Born in 1854, Mick is still touring. <laughs> Time now for the Missing Words round, which this week features as its guest publication, Raisin Views, the voice of the raisin industry. <laughs> I'm a regular subscriber, as indeed are all of its subscribers. <laughs> and we start with... Woman trapped in what for 90 minutes? Tom Jones. <laughs> a state of indecision. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the answer is woman trapped in flat pack wardrobe <laughs> for 90 minutes. Uh, this is one of the many unusual calls revealed by the Leicester Fire Brigade, which also included a man who got his toe stuck in a bath tap after his wife said, don't stick your toe in the bath tap. <laughs> Sadly, she was stuck in a wardrobe at the time, so he didn't hear her. <laughs> Next, I tell callers I'm what, but actually, I'm what? I tell callers I'm Lusty Lolita with the sexual desire of a panther, but I'm actually John Major, who used to be Prime Minister of this country. <laughs> it's pretty much the right answer, yes. <laughs> I tell callers I'm a leggy brunette carrying a whip, but actually I'm short ginger and often holding an iron. Oh, this is 55-year-old sex line worker Maureen Gardner. Here she is on the phone, using her one good ear. After the accident she had last time someone phoned her up... <laughs> while she was doing the ironing. <laughs> Next, footballers are what, according to new study? I know this one. They're actually highly intelligent. It's absolutely the correct answer. Mm. Mm. A Swedish study has found that footballers are more intelligent than previously thought. As if to prove it, <laughs> here's Burnley defender Clark Carlisle appearing on Countdown. Somewhat less impressive when you realise the word he came up with was go. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Cabby sneezes and what? And... Immediately apologises. Yes. <laughs> Cabby sneezes and takes wrong turn into canal. It's almost the right answer. Cabby sneezes and wrecks monument. This is a taxi driver, Matty Levy, who sneezed whilst driving and careered into a 15th century monument. The monument in Cheddar is now cordoned off, leaving heartbroken residents with nothing to piss against on their way home from the park. <laughs> Next, popular raisin seminars teach new recipes using what, what and what? In all honesty, there's no chance we're ever going to get it, <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> even showing it to us is an insult, really. Well, I think you'll kick yourself when you find out what the answer what is. What is it? Raisins, raisins and more raisins. Is the right hey! answer. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Popular raisin <laughs> seminars teach new recipes using raisins, raisin paste and raisin juice concentrate. <laughs> One speaker at the seminar was a member of the National Dried Fruit Trade Association, Christopher Longbottom. <laughs> well, that's dried fruit for you. <laughs> and finally, you want babies, my girl? Then don't what? Take your tights off. <laughs> no, do take your tights off. <laughs> don't keep your tights on. <laughs> don't use raisins as a contraceptive, they fall out. Uh, well, the answer is, you want babies, my girl, then don't hit your lover in the face. <laughs> this is the news that the Edinburgh Zoo pandas are more prone to slap than tickle. Oh. Here is another panda, this time in the USA, behaving in an upsetting manner. Purple panda! Oh, is it coming? Oh, oh, oh. Well, there he is. Look, here's a panda. Hello, purple panda. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
children stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so, the final scores are... Paul and Miles have seven points, but the winners this week are Ian and Grace with eight. <laughs> <laughs> Before we go, there's just time for the caption competition. <laughs> we do live in the greater London area. <laughs> and I'll leave you with the news that with the race to be Mayor of London hotting up, one of the candidates resorts to a Vladimir Putin style of campaigning. As Alan Titchmarsh's latest novel is turned into a movie, filming begins on the romantic love scene. <laughs> and at a park in Barnsley, Prince Charles attends the unveiling of a statue commemorating Britain's finest prostate doctor. <laughs> Good night. Joe Brand is back in charge when Have I Got News For You returns. That's on Friday night at nine. Now, Dennis Avey broke into a concentration camp and rescued an inmate. His story is shocking and remarkable, but is it unbelievable? Witness to Auschwitz next here on BBC One.